Thank you. Thank you all for coming here on weekend for this session of the Macau Literary uh, Festival. Our guests are Dong Xi and Tan Jian Qiao. The theme is Endless Wandering, the Broadened Horizons of Fictional Narrative. Dong Xi is the pen name of our writer. It means East and West. It's also uh, used to refer to things in Chinese. Many of you are probably familiar with his works. He lives in Nanning, very near us. But I heard that your flight here uh, was delayed for two hours. It took almost three hours. So sometimes short distance doesn't mean absolute convenience. Dong Xi is one of the most representative figures in contemporary Chinese literary scene. He has been writing for more than 30 years. At first, he was an avant-garde uh, writer. And then his works have evolved throughout the years. He's a very prolific and diligent writer. You've probably heard of his works like Record of Regrets, A Slap in the Face, Tampering with Life, or Life Without Words. Last year, his novel called Echoes won the f the 11th Maoduan Literary Prize, the most prestigious novel award program in China. It's a very huge recognition of his achievements. He, one of his works has been adapted by renowned Chinese director Feng Xiaogang into a TV drama. If you're interested, you can check it out on the internet, on the streaming sites. Like his pen name, his writing inherits the best traditions of Eastern and Western writings. He also innovates consistently, and he has a strong and distinctive personal style. It's very unique aesthetics. In his novels, novellas, and short stories, we can all see his distinctive style. Dr. Tan Jianqiao. It's called Tan Jianqiao. He is a doctor of cardiology. Well, I feel very familiar at the sight of him because I have a heart surgery. I'm not his patient. I'm here to um, discuss literature with him. He is very busy with work at hospital. But his job at the hospital actually benefits his writing because he interacts with many patients. I guess this is a, an endless source of materials for writing. He is an excellent essayist and also short story writer. He mainly writes short stories and probably doesn't have enough time to write longer pieces. Yesterday, I asked him and he said he doesn't have any plan for novels yet. 
Macau is a small place, but full of stories. And I hope one day Dr. Tan will have time to write the Macau stories in a longer form. Next, I would like to hand the floor to the uh, our guest of honor. I want to ask, where did your pen name Dongxi come from? Thank you all. It's like our literary friends. Thank you all, my literary friends, for taking your time to come here and talk, uh, hear us talk about literature. And th thank you, uh, Professor Yao. We became WeChat friends in Beijing. And at that time, I thought we would meet again in Macau. And here the day comes. And thank you f to Dr. Tan, writer plus doctor. I got asked about my pain name a lot. If you know something about Chinese, you would know. Dongxi is not a very good thing. It's kind of a derogative term. I remember the first time I went to Beijing for the Lu Xun Literary Prize in 1998. I was sitting in a room with a Shandong writer. Then a journalist friend asked me out. When I came back, that Shandong writer said, your pen name is a curse word. Somebody knocked on the door and said, is there, is Dongxi living here? And he said, I'm not Dongxi. It's like, I'm nothing. <laughs> so he was quite suspicious about my pen name and the connotations. I started writing short stories in 1990s, and I was quite an avant-gardist. Something like the uh, internet writers these days, they want to have a rebellious posture. When I first started uh, out as a novelist, it was uh, kind of the trend to have some unconventional names like Jia Pingwa and Mo Yan. I think Dongxi was easy to remember. I once said, if you are bad at writing, at least you should have an easy to remember pen name. Dongxi also carries a lot of connotations, and there are a lot of Chinese expressions related to Dongxi. That's the origin of my pen name. <laughs> the pen name is, has really rich connotations. I think the pen name has become your unique symbol and label. The theme of our talk today called Endless Wandering actually came from a poem about Fuchun River written by Wu Jun. It's a very long poem, but it opens like this, uh, Endless Wandering. I think it suits the style of our writer Dong Xi. Next, I want to ask Dr. Tan. You have a very busy schedule as a cardiology uh, doctor, but how did you manage to write? Did it develop since you were a little kid? And how did you do it? When I was little, in I think my life was not that different from yours. Teachers and my parents.
parents emphasized education on Chinese language, and there are a lot of ancient Chinese poems and essays in our uh, home library. When I was on, uh, in second or third grade in primary school, my mother would take me to recite a Tang and Song Dynasty poem every night after school. It was not, not like a homework, and I didn't know thoroughly about the poems I recited. But I think it's a kind of immersive training. It developed my sensitivity towards words and language. It was like a seed of literature in me. I wasn't really uh, receiving a different education. I was into reading history and culture. That was in the 1990s. And I chose to pursue science and medicine because it was the trend back in the 1990s, mainland China. At the time, I excelled in chemistry, so I chose to study chemistry. And later, I chose to study medicine. Medicine requires a lot of reciting, and I think it's similar to liberal arts subjects. I preferred um, medicine to science. I went to Sun Yat-sen University, and I attended many extracurricular activities. It was crucial to excel both in your academics and also in the extracurricular um, activities. There were a lot of contests going on in the university, like in painting or script writing, and I participated in some of them and won some awards. It kind of encouraged my love for literature. I didn't spend much time creating. After graduation, I realized that uh, you can actually learn a lot things um, different from the university. Like Dong Xi said, writing is a technique, but it's also an exercise. If I were a primary school or secondary school student, there was no way I could be so observant about society. I've been in Macau for more than 10 years, and I've witnessed a lot of changes in families and in society. And it's kind of an exercise for my creative side. Gradually, I began to write things in my spare time to share with readers. That's my creative journey. Thank you, Dr. Tan. He, Ms. The Dr. Tan lives in, uh, works in Qianwu Hospital, and there is a statue of Sun Yat-sen in front of the hospital. Dr. Sun Yat-sen used to work in this hospital. I think he was a surgeon, too. In 1892, Dr. Sun Yi-sen graduated in Hong Kong. At that time, Macau was under the administration of Xiangshan County, uh, Sun Yi-sen's hometown. 
So he was really familiar with Macau. Then he chose to work in Kenwu Hospital. He was the first Chinese Western style medic uh, doctor in China. Before he came, the hospital did not have a very comprehensive um, modern medical system. His arrival in the, in the hospital was really revolutionary. He mainly served the Portuguese people back then. So the influence was pretty limited. He was a very key figure in the history of Genghu Hospital. I think, like Lu Xun, Sun Yitzhen thought that it was not enough to cure people's body. It's more important to awaken people's souls. That's why they gave up medicine to write literature or uh, engage in revolution. We know that Guangxi and Guangdong shared the same status in ancient China. It was seen as a barbarian and marginal place. And here we have two concepts like the center and the margin. Dongxi has been living in his hometown Guangxi throughout his life. And we also know a lot of famous writers like Yu Hua. They moved to Beijing, the center of culture in China. It's quite convenient to live in Beijing as a writer, but Dong Xi didn't make that same choice. He still lives and works in Guangxi. I want to ask Dong Xi, what's your opinion on the relationship between the center and the margins? You live in quite a marginal city. Do you feel any limitations or constraints? Or do you feel liberated by your presence in the margin? A good question. In China, if you want to be famous, quickly, you go to Beijing or Shanghai. These two major cities can help you build your fame because there are many literary journals like People's Literature, Harvest, and October. There are also quality media outlets that can promote you, like Mo Yan. He moved from Shandong to Beijing. Yu Hua left Zhejiang, Haiyan. Yu Hua was originally from Haiyan County, and then he got a job in the provincial capital, Hangzhou. At that time, I was approached by the same Zhejiang province, and they offered very favorable conditions like housing, allowances, and others. At that time, Hangzhou, I think the housing price in Hangzhou was 50 or 60,000 per square meter. And Yu Hua asked me to go with him, but I gave up. I turned down that offer. I also received offers from Beijing and Guangzhou, but I didn't accept any of them. I think if I stay in my hometown, I may grow slower, but in a more steadier, in a steadier way. When my book, like Tampering with Life, came out, a journalist in Xinjiang asked me, is the countryside really like what you portrayed in your book? And I asked him, have you ever been to the countryside? 
He said, "I went on a day trip in the countryside, and I said, 'It's not the same. You have to be there to really see it." I f find that people are so ignorant about the countryside, the rural areas in China. My family, all my family are in Guangxi. I can go back to my home village in within three hours. And another benefit of staying in the margin is you will be down to the earth. In the 1990s, I was already a very prolific writer, making a lot of money because many of my works were adapted into TV dramas or films. And I think if I move to university, uh, move to major cities, the m pursuit of materials will sabotage my creativity. I would be anxious about not making enough money. If I stay in Guangxi, I will focus all my attention on writing. The downside of living in the margin is you have to be loud enough. Guangxi is known for its mountainside ballads. That's because the population is not dense, and we had to shout out loud. It's the same with writing. If you are far away from the center, your voice, your pitch has to be higher. You have to be different from other writers on the market. With the emergence of AI these days, many professions are being threatened, and we have to be more careful about our creativity in literary writing. We have to be innovative. We have to be unique. I guess for marginal writers and as well as Greater Bay Area writers, uh, we have this advantage of being marginal, of being unique. Even AI can write novels in the future. It will still need our creativity. I have this short story called Commodities. I was living in Hechi, Guangxi Province, at that time, and I foresaw the emergence of the commercialization of literature. And I spent the stories in three parts. The first time is raw. Uh, the first part is raw materials, and then tools. The raw materials is love story, and the second part is called works and products. In this story, I distinguished between products and works of art. And the third part is commentary and advertisement. The, it talks about your contribution, contributing an article to journals. When a story is not like a story, a great work of literature may be born. 
a writer. I talk, I wrote, uh, I write about the entire process of story writing and story publishing. Ah, when you open the lab door, it's open. But if you're a writer, if you live in the marginal part of China, you have to promote yourself. Lan Fan, a commentator, likes this short story very much, and he classified、um, the story as an avant-garde work. And I also touched upon the subject of the com commercialization of love. So the story talked about the commer commercialization of literature and art. Then my novel *Life Without Words* won the first Lu Xun Literary Prize. I was in my late twenties and early thirties. When I came back hometown, my sister told me. Uh, there's a deaf person in our village. He is helping everyone in the village work. But one problem is the deaf person cannot understand the orders, the commands properly. I think it's quite a realistic analogy. It's like politics today. For example. In a in an ill-informed society, if the order is you have to get vaccinated, it might get distorted when the orders go is、uh, transmitted from the top to the bottom. That's why I wanted to write a story about deafness. I asked myself a lot of questions. What new things can I bring into this story? What uniqueness does it have? I stopped midway. Like Shi Tie Sheng's short story, writes about a blind person, and it's a very Good and original piece. Later, it was、um, directed by Chen Kai Ge. In this story, it's about an Arhu player、uh, who is. Blind, and when I set my mind to write the story about a deaf person, I asked myself, "Can I be as good as this one?" And then an epiphany hit me, and I decided to combine a deaf person, a blind person, and a person who cannot speak into one family. It's like a dumb person, a deaf person, and a blind person form a family, and they make up for each other's disadvantages by helping each other. That's the story of life without words, like Russia. Ukraine relationship or Israel-Palestine relationship. Well, I think it's all very similar、um, to what I write in Life Without Words. It was loved by the renowned writer Wang Meng. Wang Meng was our literary idol when I was young. And he loved this story very much. The uniqueness of my novel was recognized by the more established writers.
That's how I won the first Lu Xuyun Literature Prize. My emphasis on innovation has been very consistent. You can see this in all of my works. In Back in 1990s, many writers copied uh, Garcia Marquez. They all copied the legendary beginning of a hundred years of solitude. But I never did this. In my work, Slap in the Face, I was writing about a person who walks backward. I tried my best to be innovative. And that person was told never to turn back. The entire family looked ahead instead of looking back. And for my other work called Record of Regrets, I spent much energy on the intricate structure. I'll go uh, talk about it maybe later. Dong Xi mentioned that you have to increase to uh, speak louder if you are writing in marginal places. And I think Dong Xi has done a really great job. Many of his works are related to voice, like slap in the face or echoes. He also writes about silence, like the novella called um, Life Without Words. I like Life Without Words very much. Because it's not like a work of fiction. That's how innovative it is. You have to break from all the norms of traditional fiction writing and establish your own narratives. From the genre to the narrative to the subject matter, this novella is all quite refreshing. In an enclosed village, a deaf person, a dumb person, oh, I have to be uh, politically sensitive. I don't want to offend any of the disabled group. So the deaf, the dumb, and the blind within one family. There are no languages, there's no speech, and the family was uh, is bullied and threatened by others. In a world like this, dramatic tension is obvious, so from the subject matter, it's extremely unique. His narrative also carries his unique style. I highly recommend this novella to all of you. It's also adapted into a film called Lovers in the Sky. It was, it, I think the, the film adaptation premiered in 2020 something. But I didn't find it on the internet. Maybe I need to pay to watch this film. It won an award at the Tokyo International Film Festival. In language, uh, Life Without Words, the ending was quite surprising. In the end, language emerges. The family has a newborn baby who can speak, but with language comes 
greater damage. It's like a double-edged sword. It can connect people in an, an ideal way, but at the same time, it can be harmful. Back to the topic of Macau. Macau is a small place with a distinct um, mixture of cultures, like from China, from Portugal, from the Philippines. People speak all kinds of languages here. You can hear Cantonese, Mandarin on the street, like we are speaking in Mandarin now. Portuguese is another official language. There are also the uh, Filipinos speaking in Tagalog. There's a rich blend of languages in Macau. For me, I can speak Portuguese, but it's not like you can effortlessly communicate with other Portuguese speakers. So I want to ask, communication is not all about language. I want to ask Mr. Dongxi, what's your relationship with language? If a person has to use different languages in his life, like in the university, in your workplace, in your writing, or with your families, you use different languages in different life scenarios. What's your relationship with uh, languages? Great question. I like your question, because Guangxi is a place with 12 ethnic minorities. Some of Guangxi people speak Cantonese. You can see many Cantopop stars holding concerts in Guangxi. Uh, people in Wu Wuzhou or Yulin speak Cantonese. And for my hometown, Hechi, we speak the southwestern, southwestern Chinese. We also have the Yao ethnic minority and Zhuang language, Zhuang dialect. So language is quite a sensitive subject. Professor Yao asked a question about communication. If you live in China today, you have to have different sets of language. If you are in an official meeting, you use a set of language. If you chat with your friends, it's another set of language. When you write on your own, and try to go to your very core, you have another set of language. And when you talk with your kids or your parents or your families, there's still new set of language. Communication is so difficult. When a sentence is uttered, it can trigger a thousand different responses. Sometimes I doubt I don't understand myself at all. It's easy to get to know another person, but it's extremely difficult to get to know yourself. Professor Wang Bingbing from Nanjing University writes a commentary about my work. He said it's about a person who sways between worlds, like Ran Dongdong in my novel, Echoes. This protagonist is a female policewoman, a policewoman called Ran Dongdong. When she was trying to crack down on a crime, he found that, uh, she found that her husband went to a hotel room twice. So in the end, the crime case was solved 
But the marriage problem was never solved. That's my way of seeing the problem of communication. It's also one of the key subjects in my novel. You say one thing, but you mean another. It delves deep into your subconsciousness, like the policewoman when she is fighting with her husband. Even after the quarrel ends, the psychological fight continues. Of course, you cannot know it in real life, but since I'm in, I'm in a literary creation, I can write about the psychological conflict. It's like Wi-Fi connection. It's invisible. It's modern. This psychological activity is one of my innovations in the novel Echoes. Language can bring comfort. We write literature because it can warm our hearts, it touches us or stimulates us, like Lu Xun's works, they encourage us to think deeper. But sometimes literature can hurt us. When we talk with our closest family members, we might subconsciously or unconsciously hurt them, even when we mean to say something nice. It's the challenging part of working as a writer, the same as being a cardio, uh, a heart surgeon. It's extremely intricate. It's extremely challenging, and you have to try your best to find the most accurate way to depict things or to solve things. When we write. Professor Yao's poems or Dr. Tan's short stories, we feel connected to them as people. That's the f fascinating part of language. Earlier, we have the South China Sea disputes, and an internet user left a comment. He said, I would love to trade the peace of South China Sea with my ex-boyfriend's life. And I was so amused by the richness and the um, whimsical part of language. Yes, language is the foundation of our existence. Language makes us love and makes us hurt each other. It's really a double-edged sword. Dong Xi talked about his novel Echoes. There are a lot of descriptions about people's psychology in this novel. You mentioned psychological quarrel, psychological fight, which is quite novel, because it's not a um, term in psychology, but it's really new in literature. The protagonist is a police woman called Ran Dong Dong, and her husband is called Mu Da Fu. The psychological tension between the couple is really intense. Is there is psychological quarrel and even psychological cheating, even if the husband. Uh, is found to be in a hotel room twice, but there's no evidence that he actually cheats on his wife. It's all for the readers to uh, judge. Dong Xi actually read a lot about psychology and criminal um, investigation before writing this novel. 
I can see that you have a very good grasp of the psychology of people. I'm very curious. With such a subtle description of people's psychology, are you a sensitive person in real life? Yes. I once said that a writer has to be sensitive. It's not about talent. Some people might say that you have to be good with language, you have to be imaginative, you have to be a, an avid reader, but none of these is as important as your sensitivity as a writer. If we are not sensitive and we don't correct anything in the world, there's no way you can become a writer, like your poems or your short stories. If you are not sensitive, you can't have inspirations. I once read the book by Taiwanese writer Long Yingtai. She wrote about her experience of taking a taxi in Taipei. She thought the taxi driver overcharged her, and she continued her experiment to find out whether it was really the taxi driver's fault. It seemed like tr such a trivial thing. Few people would pay attention to this, but a writer will pay attention to details. If you leverage this sensitivity to in your writing, you will definitely excel. It's The sensitivity is like a weapon. You can't use it to hurt yourself. You have to handle it really carefully. I cherish my sensitivity. I am so afraid that someday it might be gone. I think you can also train your sensitivity in writing. I'll talk for two minutes before I, uh, letting Dr. Tan speak about it. I grew up in the countryside. I grew up in the mountains. I was once drenched in rain and continued to work after the clothes were dried by clothes. I was harmed because I grew up in a poor family. I think that's one of my advantages as a sensitive writer. Thank you, Dongxi. We, I think we have 10 minutes left. Wow, time really flies. Next. I, I thought it was uh, it will end at 4.30. Maybe there's a mistake. Um, back to Dr. Tan. I, I'm sure you are very sensitive. And uh, I think you've seen many interesting things in your work and you feel the urge to write about it. Yes. There are many people working in the hospital. And they tend to get used to it very soon. And uh, to put it in a blunt way, like death or birth may be rare occasions in your life, but for medical workers, you see it, you witness it every day. You might not be the closest circle, but you are a part of the deaths and births in the hospital. You see people's sufferings on a daily basis. I don't know if my colleagues feel the same, but for me, every time I witness a death, I feel differently. 
个叫康宁中心，这个这空这康宁中心的意思就是。In, in Kingwu Hospital, we have this palliative ward where patients literally wait for their natural death. But there's no way you will see, you will anticipate when the patients will pass away. In this hospice care ward, Doctors are required to arrive on a person's deathbed, and for me, I often need to be summoned to the hospice care ward. Ah, but his family has already given up. But he has many tubes and tubes. There are tubes. Probably still tubes or medical equipment attached to that person. After this patient passes away, you need to remove all the equipment. And when I do this, I feel as if I was removing the soul from the patient. When you deal with the death. When we're trying to remove the pacemaker, you had to cut open the skin to remove the pacemaker. There will be no blood, but you have to handle the wound carefully so that um, the patient will have a dignified death. You have to make the patient's family members feel that you care about them. I feel my responsibility and my sense of responsibility. You are not saving lives, but instead you are trying to see this person off in a dignified way. It's our utmost responsibility. We are trying to make the patient look the best in his final stop in this world. Just now, Dong Xi mentioned also about the interpersonal communication. When you say one thing, but other people hear another thing. As literary creators, we might be extra sensitive to this. I, want, I quoted from things I heard at work in my writings. Still about death. When a person passes away, they will have a form of registration, and you have to indicate the place of birth. Macau is an immigrant city. Sometimes we encounter family members, they are not aware of the place of origin of the deceased person. They might be in, living in Macau for two or three generations, and it, there was no way they could figure out the place of origin for that person. It's a very vague concept. Sometimes they talk about places that no longer is, exist today, like Xiangshan County, which is now Zhongshan City, or Xinhui County, which doesn't exist right now. It's Xinhui District in Jiangmen City. It's some of the peculiarities of working in a hospital. Once I encountered this death of a patient, and the nurse was asking about the place of origin of this deceased person. 
But the family member had no idea. And she just made up a word. I was really shocked by this. For me, Macau is an immigrant city. Everybody has their own roots. But as time goes by, people gradually forget about their place of origin. And this ends up being a plot in my short story. Many scenarios in our daily life are worth writing about. They can be a source of inspirations. They can be the starting point of your writing. It can be a main ingredient or a condiment in your writing. Thank you, Dr. Tan. You mentioned hospice care in Qinghu Hospital. In Chinese, it means peace and health. The name is quite auspicious, but the orthodox, uh, the complex part is that it's about the last stop in a person's life. We are running out of time, but I have another question for Dong Xi. Your works have been translated into English and French and many other languages, but not Portuguese. We have the students of the Portuguese department. Maybe one day you will translate Dong Xi's works into Portuguese. I would recommend Life Without Words. And I really look forward to read your works in Portuguese. How do you feel the relationship between Chinese literature and world literature? I think we overly emphasize the importance of going into the world, but there is no need to emphasize this because we are already in this world. How do you view your works in translation? And do you have a Nobel Prize complex? We are in this world, well put, Professor Yao. Chinese writing is part of world literature. When we reread ancient Chinese classics or Lu Xun, Shen Congwen, Lao She's stories, they are still highly related to today's world. Before the reform and opening up, we had our imagination of the world. We th thought that the beautiful world, a good literature is in other places. But when we started to connect with writers from other places, you will find your similarities significantly. So translation is really key to help your works enter a bigger readership for Europeans and Americans. Are they willing to learn to know about your works? There is the linguistic barrier. Because they have already formed their own circle and your your works in Chinese might not be that significant to us. For Chinese literature, we read a lot of translated works um, from English, from other languages. And uh, for Chinese publishers, we invest a lot of time and energy into bringing in translated works. We have a large population, and we have a large enough readership. In those 
countries with a smaller population, they might not deem translating Chinese literature as cost effective. And don't be so anxious to enter the world stage. We are already in this world. I don't have a Nobel Prize pri uh, complex. I think what comes will come. Uh, Any questions from the audience? Please remind the speaker to use the microphone. I'm from Huai'an, Jiangsu province. Last summer vacation, I went back home and I saw a giant LED screen. And I learned about your works on that LED screen. Behind that LED screen, there were a group of middle-aged women dancing on the square. I feel that your uh, ordinary people or ordinary readers don't pay much attention to literary prizes. Your Literary work has been adapted into TV drama or film, and they might attract more readers to your books. Like uh, Hong Kong director Wang Ka Wai's adaptation of Blossoms by Jin Yicheng. I want to ask. The film and TV adaptation, does it influence your creation? Uh, some writers want to be popular. They want to have as many readers as possible. That's one kind of literary ideal. For others, they have a specific target readership. The TV adaptation of my book is not really well received, but because it's a complicated story, I will not go into details. Um, for writers like me, we don't want to be as popular as possible. We don't target for a specific group of people. We just write what we want to express. I think it's the same for Professor Yao and Dr. Tan. I think um, you have to be careful. You can't anticipate 1.4 billion of readers who can feel the same as you. There are at most 10,000 people who feel the same as you. So lower your expectations. Don't aim to be popular. Uh, like famous writer Lu Xun, his mother was a fan of the popular writer Zhang Henshui. But look, a hundred years later, who are we talking about, Lu Xun or Zhang Henshui? If you want to be a best-selling author, you have to lower your level of recognition to the general public. Yes, the ideal reader cannot have a big number. Next question. I have a question for Dr. Tan. I have family members who is a medical worker. Of course, he does not write. I often visit her in the hospital. And I feel psychologically unbearable. But this uncle, he seems quite used to it. 
And I think he intentionally、um, desensitized his senses. Dong Xu mentioned that it's important for a writer to remain sensitive. I want to ask Dr. Tan, as a medical worker and a writer, how can you strike a balance between the writer's sensitivity and the medical worker's protection, self-protection? I think you have to say every day is a new beginning. Every day is a new page. It's not just repetitive cycles of working, eating, sleeping. You have to tell yourself every morning when you wake up, it's a brand new day. With this mentality, every person you encounter, your colleagues, your patients. Um, it will give you new feelings. Don't make yourselves、uh, numb. And the secondly, don't be overwhelmed by the negative experiences in life. It's never inevitable that you will see something that. That's unhappy, but remain in control. Sometimes you have to remain detached from the ashes of this negativity. You have to use another new perspective to try to find a silver lining. Thirdly. Remain positive. Remain optimistic about the goodness of people. Of course, we read a lot about、um, bad news. And sometimes you will feel frustrated. You get questioned. By patients and their families. But try your best to remain positive. Despite all the negative things going on, try to focus on the good side of people. We all have dark places in our hearts, but I believe even a criminal will have something that worth our praise and worth recognition. That's my way of.、Um, Striking a balance between self-protection and、uh, sensitivity. If you have other questions, you can talk with Dr. Tan after the session. Okay, last question. Thank you, Mr. Dong Xi. You mentioned your residency in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I used to study in the National University of Singapore, and I once participated in a workshop in Nanyang Technological University. My personal experience in Singapore. Uh, uh, is, Things in my hometown, like the northwestern of China, I want to know that when you are in a different place and still read about your hometown, will you feel differently? 
And when you are in a different place and try to write about your hometown, how do you do it? I once I was once in the your university, the National University of Singapore. I think the farther away you are from home, the more homesick you will be. The Singapore people are so passionate about literature in Tang and Song dynasty, which is really touching. And for some Taiwan people, their cultural roots, their attachment to their cultural roots, like Tang and Song dynasties, remain strong. Another example is Shen Congwen's fiction writing. It's really well received in overseas markets because every people thinks about thinks of their hometown when they read about Shen Congwen. I spent half a year in Singapore. And it was a short interval. I don't think it will impact the accuracy in your writing about your hometown. But if the period extends, it will inevitably uh, influence or impact your accuracy. We are about time to finish. Thank you again, Dong Xi and uh, Dr. Tan. And thank you for all the audience. And I hope we will meet again soon.